Okay, um, we'll get started. So thank you everyone for joining us today. It's so great to see so many have signed up and are currently joining. Um, and also good morning, good afternoon or good evening, depending on where you're joining from. My name is Luke Howard. I will be your host today um, for this webinar on the public consultation phase of the ACORN framework and ACORN methodology. Or more specifically, the webinar will be about the uh, initiation of this public consultation phase. So I'll give a quick run through of the agenda and what to expect. First, we will have an introduction to Plan Vivo and how we um, have partnered with ACORN on this program, and that will be provided by Keith Bohannon. Then we'll move into a bit more around the program itself and Rabobank's aspirations around it and why it, it created the ACORN program, which will be provided by Ian van der Mortel. Then we'll start to dive into the detail, specifically around one of our two main topics today, which is the ACORN framework. Uh, Alina will provide information about what this is, how it operates, and also provide a demo of um, how it works on the back end with the platform. Then we'll, we'll dive again into more detail about our second topic, which is the methodology, uh, how the ACOR methodology operates, um, how that works to calculate climate benefits. And Alina will talk through this and also provide another demo, but this time we'll look at um, how it operates to do the GIS. And then we'll round off the uh, webinar today with a Q&A session, which I'll, I will provide some more information on shortly. But first, a bit of housekeeping. So everyone's on mute, as you probably already realized. Um, and you can submit questions for that Q&A session using the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Uh, we request that you use that box rather than the chat box because it's easier for man to manage and that's where we will be looking uh, when it comes to the Q&A session. The webinar will be approximately 60 minutes and it is currently being recorded and will be uploaded onto the Plan Vivo website as soon as possible uh, after the webinar. So you're more than welcome to share it with your colleagues. Any documents that we refer to today, such as the framework and the methodology, will be available on the Plan Vivo website again as soon as possible. Well, I to today, but as soon as possible. Today. A bit of information though before we get started on the Consultation that's what this is all about. Um, the public consultation is an opportunity for to provide your feedback on this framework and methodology. It will be open for one month and have the thoughts and feedback and opinions of the voting date and the You will be providing a feedback form which we can send out after. Uh, audio problems. I apologize if that's the next day on the Sorry, audio is yeah. How's that? Better? Okay. My apologies, everyone. Um I'll start this slide again then. So yeah, the um a bit of information about the public consultation, since this is what it is all about. Um, the public consultation is your opportunity to give feedback to um, on the methodology and on the framework to ACORN and the Plan Vivo Foundation. Um, and the closing deadline for this is the 15th of March 2022. So if you could provide any feedback before then, that would be great. We will be sending out a form through which you can structure your feedback uh, via an email to all attendees today. But we will also be including this form on the Plan Vivo website if uh, for some reason you don't get an email or you'll use the email. Any feedback we receive will be used uh, when redrafting the methodology and um, framework later this year. And if you have any specific questions regarding this, or you want to know a bit more about ACORN, then we recommend that you contact Alina, uh, one of the speakers today, at the email address on the slide there. We will do our best to answer as many questions from the Q&A section as possible, but I mean, as we all know, when it comes to webinars, often there are too many to answer. So we will, make a, uh, we will record any questions that we do not answer, and we will um, formally answer them and place them on the Plan Vivo website in the coming days after the webinar. So just check back there if your question wasn't, if your question was not answered. 
A quick look at the uh, speakers we have today. We have Alina Kajim, who's the head of certification at ACORN. Uh, we also have Yelma van der Motel, who's the head of ACORN cell itself. Uh, Lena will be providing information on the framework and methodology, whereas Yelma will provide an overview of ACORN. We've got Keith Bohannon, who's the CEO, CEO of Plan Vivo. He will um, provide a bit more of the information about the background of Plan Vivo and our partnership. And then finally, myself, I'm here as the host uh, and uh, mediator. We also are very lucky to have uh, two people who are supporting on the Q&A who can provide a bit more technical know-how than ourselves. So we have Mila, who's the head of remote sensing at ACORN, and also Nick, who is a managing partner at the Landscapes and Livelihood Group. So thank you very much both for joining. Uh, we appreciate that. So I will now hand over to Keith, who will talk a bit more about Plan Vivo and our partnership with ACORN. Over to you, Keith. Thanks a lot, Luke, uh, and hi, everybody. Uh, greetings from the heart of Scotland. Very, very pleased to see so many people here today for the webinar. Um, I would just like to spend a few minutes just giving a bit of background to who Plan Vivo are uh, and how this partnership uh, with Rabobank on ACORN uh, came about. Um, some of you will know who we are already, but for those who don't, uh, Plan Vivo is a charitable foundation, and also most of you may know us as a, a voluntary carbon market standard. And we've been running for uh, over 25 years. Actually, this year is our 25th birthday. Um, we work in the voluntary carbon market with smallholders and communities, and we strongly believe that we want to work directly with those people most affected by climate change. The Plan Vivo model is designed in such a way that those people, those smallholders and communities are put at the center of the design process. So this is not a case where we have a model which is kind of copy and pasted to different parts of the world. Communities and smallholders must engage directly in the design process to design their own solutions to the issues they're facing. Um, as part of, of maybe where we're different to other standards in the voluntary carbon market, one of the key values we have is this idea of equitable benefit sharing. So really important that these communities can access the voluntary carbon market and we want to make sure that the benefits, the, the, the carbon finance goes back to those communities. So at least 60% uh, of that benefit must go back uh, to those communities. And finally, another USP from Plan Vivo is that we have a holistic model for natural climate solutions. So yes, of course, we're a carbon standard and we're certifying real additional and verifiable carbon benefits, but also alongside that, we are making sure that there are long-term social and livelihood benefits um, and also for both people um, in terms of resilience strengthening and also for biodiversity conservation. So, um, so talking more about that holistic model, so we have, these are the key components of the standard requirements, which you can read online. We have some requirements very much around that participatory design aspect, obviously around the carbon, uh, which has to be very clear, but also on the social impact and biodiversity impact. And, and that's how we measure our impact uh, in all these areas, not just in ton, terms of tons of CO2 emission reductions, but also in terms of number of people reached and in terms of number of hectares under sustainable land management. Next slide, please. So we've grown from a, a small standard and um, working with small community projects to something which now has quite a lot of scale uh, from the different projects we work with. We work with 26 projects in over 20 countries, um, mainly on projects such as uh, like tree planting, uh, afforestation, reforestation projects, red and uh, avoided um, deforestation projects, and also uh, emerging areas such as blue carbon. And so our, our strategy is to grow those, but also to look at branching out, which is part of where this partnership came from, to partner with other organizations that have similar values and similar ambitions to us, uh, where we can Kind of work together to maybe increase our impact and also to look to broaden the influence we have on uh, in terms of representing people we work with within the plan vivo network 
So our aim is to scale with care, is to grow the impact, but to not lose the values from, from where we come from. Next slide, please. And that's the background to where these discussions uh, led to this partnership, which we've been working with Rabobank for over a year now. And I think as a kind of setup for the, for the next discussions, it's worth bearing in mind that this came about from a partnership that's come from common values, complementary strengths and common goals. And Plan Vivo in the ACORN partnership, we are the certifying standard. We, we've worked very closely with the ACORN team uh, to, to review and approve the framework and the methodology. And the common goals we have are that, that renewed focus on smallholder farmers, harnessing innovation, which you'll hear more about just now, to facilitate this equitable access to carbon finance, and making sure that any carbon benefits delivered are really robust, but bring with them also those wider positive impacts for people and nature. So I'll stop there and pass over to Yelmer to tell you a bit more about ACORN and um, before we go into the details. Thank you very much. Thank you, Luke, and thank you, Keith, and fully acknowledging the strong partnership that we have with Plan Vivo. Uh, it has a very constructive co-creation uh, with a common goal, indeed, to support smallholder farmers. Why Rabobank, you may ask? In the first place, to support those smallholder farmers, to increase their productivity and protect them for the impact of global warming. Also enabling climate equity and climate finance for those that need it most in our belief and help them to grow this, uh, the transition to sustainable farming. As such, the carbon market, the voluntary carbon market, is not a, is not a target on itself. It's a means to an end. As Global Food and Agri Bank and founded as a cooperative by farmers, it always has been in our DNA to support farmers in those transitions. Besides the benefits for those smallholder farmers, it also helps on a regional level, for instance, with flock protection or food security, and also, of course, globally combating climate change. Our goal was to make it happen on a pragmatic and scalable way. But therefore, we also were uh, realizing that we could never do it alone. Creating an ecosystem with many partners, like Plan Vivo, but also with remote sensing partners, like Satelligence and Space for Good, with buyers to set the carbon removal units characteristics, and of course, the local partners, the cooperatives, the NGOs, like Solidaridad, governments that support the farmers on the ground with registering to the ACON program, select the right agroforestry dimensions, the logistics and the education. As such, we also want to challenge a bit the characteristics of the voluntary carbon market. If we can go to the next slide. And we wanted to raise the bar. So of course, corporates and governments have to reduce their emissions. But in the voluntary carbon market, we said, okay, we want to create a, a new standard. Removals instead of uh, reductions, exposed instead of ex ante, nature-based. Yelma, sorry, I think we're having some difficulty with your mic. Um, you dropped out after the word nature base. Just checking if you're able to re uh, reconnect on that front. Apologies. Ah, there uh, we go. You're back. Um, so we wanted to raise the, uh, the bar in the voluntary carbon market with removal credits instead of reduction credits, with exposed credits instead of ex ante credits, strong benefits for the smallholder farmers with payouts of 80% directly flowing back to the smallholder farmer, traceable and transparent when, where, and whom is the carbon uh, sequestered, and also objective in a measurable way with the remote sensing. How does it work in a nutshell? If we can go to the next slide. We hope to reach millions of farmers that start planting those trees in an agroforestry scheme. So it always should contribute uh, to uh, also in the, uh, in the production of food. Local partners that help those partners collect the data, collect the farmer data, collect the field polygons. And based on that, together with the partners, we measure the delta and biomass over the past year. 
based on the framework and the methodology, we translate this to carbon removal units and we sell those to corporates. We register them on the ACORN website and we pay out the 80% to the farmers. 10% for the local partner and 10% for ACORN for the activities of measuring, marketing, carbon removal units. Looking forward to scale this proposition together in a large ecosystem and feel free to reach out to us if you can help in scaling in this, uh, help us in reaching the ambition of reaching millions of farmers before 2030. Over to you, Alien. Sorry, I first had to unmute myself, so I'll go back to the slide now. Hi, everyone, and uh, thank gentlemen for the great introduction. Uh, my name is Eline Kaim, um, and I'm here to dive into the methodology and framework a bit more now that we have had the introduction. Uh, by the end of last year, we already got the opportunity to announce the ACORN framework, and it has been uh, available online for a couple of months now. But here today, we're now also to complete the entire application framework by publishing the um, methodology that's related to the ACORN framework. So without further ado, let's dive into it. I'll start by the framework. Um, when we started to, to finalize the, the concept of ACORN, we saw that there were many barriers for entering the voluntary carbon market for smallholder farmers. Um, probably all aware of you, but the high certification costs, but also the complexity of the existing standards and methodologies out there. So what we did, we went to all different uh, standards and start to explain that we were looking for a methodology that was particularly focused on the voluntary carbon market, ex post uh, credits that were particularly focused on smallholder agroforestry projects. Well, it turned out there was not such specialized methodology and framework out there yet. So what we hope to reach with, with developing this is that we are able to generate a more scalable approach uh, and also uh, facilitate the transition to a more sustainable agricultural practice and particularly at farm level. So as I said, the, the framework has been approved by the Plan Vivo Technical Committee as the secretary in September 20, uh, 2021. But what does the framework actually distinguishes and who can apply it? Well, we've said that the unique selling points can be captured in three S's. So we allow a sample based approach where normally you are expected to uh, certify each single project. We now have an ACORN umbrella uh, in which we all have separate projects, but we are actually, uh, through having a standard, we are now able to implement um, sample-based monitoring. The second one is the scalable approach. It actually allows, this methodology allows us to implement satellite technology and allowing us to reduce uh, the cost for monitoring quite extensively. And then the last one, and it's also something that the VVBs who validated it um, have recognized, is that the approach has become simplified. It's much easier to understand, but also uh, the approach to additionality has a simplified version and um, monitoring the socioeconomical elements of it. But then who can apply it? Uh, eligibility uh, assessments are done also within ACORN, but we have split it into two separate elements. So first of all, as Yama already mentioned, the local partner are a very important stakeholder for us. Um, they are the ones on the ground and in contact with the farmers. So what we look into is if they have the capacity to undertake long-term projects, if they have the ability to mobilize the necessary resources, for example, think about nurseries, but also agronomists to make the agroforestry designs. And does the local partner have the experience and the skills to train farmers to implement the agroforestry and help farmers monitoring all, the, all that comes with the particular project activity? Well, then diving into the farmers that are linked to these local partners. We within ACORN say that smallholder farmers should have cultivated lands between 0.1 hectares and 10 hectares. Farmers should be able to demonstrate the land tenure and the carbon rights. We, through our local partner, we will do a verbal check uh, if no deforestation has taken place. And we we'll combine that by a more remote check to really make sure uh, no clearance has taken place before that. 
um, additionality, I will come back to that topic in a bit, um, should be demonstrated. And also we allow existing agroforestry to be onboarded on the ACORN program. Good to know is that agroforestry should then not be implemented later than five years ago. And the CO2 that's being sequestered must not have been monetized yet. Also good to be aware of is that we will only generate credit uh, from a year ago. So not going back five years ago. Then the ACORN framework highlights 10 principles that I quickly want to go through with you. Um, the first one is already mentioned, the eligibility, but also uh, uh, highlighted by Keith, the importance of having the involvement of the local community and the participants of the program. The framework also describes what responsibilities are out there for different stakeholders and all CRUs that are being delivered within the ACORN program are generated with <coughs> integrity by being additional and having real project interventions. Uh, CRUs are realized uh, based on exposed uh, methodologies and besides the carbon that's being sequestered, we also demonstrate the uh, social impact and environmental impact that our projects have. The CRUs are data driven and uh, we will make sure that any mitigating actions are taken for other potential CO2 emissions. Uh, the CRUs that are delivered are registered on the Labobank registry and all our CRUs come with a durability period of 20 years. Also that topic I will address a little bit later. Then the last two uh, principles, we implement a uh, risk reversal assessment and as a bank you can imagine that all the data that we acquire uh, for the projects must be handled with the highest level of integrity. And therefore we ask all stakeholders to complete a data consent form. Well, having slightly touched upon that, these principles, uh, underneath these principles, we have a set of requirements. Uh, all can be found in chapter four of the framework. But to say so, the additionality. So additionality can be addressed within the ACORN program in two uh, by two separate elements. First of all, we have implemented the, the well-known barrier uh, analysis that has also been used by other projects within Plan Vivo, but we're also working to develop a agroforestry specific positive list, which would allow um, projects to demonstrate additionality by simply answering a few questions. Good to know is that we're still validating this approach, so it cannot be used as a standalone approach as of yet. Uh, but hopefully we can once we have validated further. Well, due to the nature of um, ACORN and, uh, and implementing agroforestry, we didn't see it as suitable to implement the concept of permanence. And therefore we are introducing the concept of durability, which means that our CRUs uh, have a durability of 20 years. Um, then all projects shall supply 15% of the CUUs that are generating to the buffer pool in order for any unforeseen perimeter losses of the carbon sequestered. Um, next to the carbon baseline that's being generated, we generate a project baseline. And this is mostly to monitor the socio-economical and environmental impacts. Well, you see two pictures on the right side there. Uh, these are uh, elements that we require all ACORN projects to monitor because it allows us to aggregate this information and really demonstrate how agroforestry ac is actually benefiting uh, the environment. So local livelihood is being um, monitored to, through two KPIs, um, the farmer income through um, carbon finance and um, the availability of nutritional variety. And the environmental improvement is being monitored through the Ginny Simpson index and really gives us an indication of how the agricultural biodiversity is. Well, I think Yelmer already mentioned this, uh, but what I think is good to be aware is that the um, CRUs are sold for a minimum price of 20 euros. 80% uh, goes flows back to the farmer and that can be either in cash payment or in-kind contributions. Uh, in the framework, you also find a list of what are considered uh, 
suitable in-kind contributions. So far the framework, I like to take this opportunity to also give you a sneak preview of um, the platform, the Acorn platform. I have a short demo on the local partner and after that I go right into the platform of the buyer. So let me see how this works. Does it play? Yes. So welcome at the uh, local partner dashboard. You already see that the local partner here has 101 farmers and 166 share use. The one on the left shows how many farmers are within Acorn already and the potential that it has in the same neighborhood. It shows the onboarding status of the farmer and on the right, you see how many farmers have already been paid out and how they need to be paid out. Then if you scroll down, you see the vintage of the, uh, the CRU and you see what the main crop is that the farmer is producing. Here's what CRUs are available and which one are sold and to who they're sold to. Please be aware it's all demo data, so it's not uh, real. So let's dive into the payout, which I think is really great. Here you can see a list of uh, the farmers that needs to be paid out. Um, these can be, oh yeah, and now we go to the other one. You also have a list of farmers that are already paid out. So it's very fairly easy for the local partner to select a number of farmers or select all farmers and then indicate whether they have made the payment and in what kind, uh, what they have done. Is it partially uh, cash and partially in kind or all cash? And that's then being updated. Well, we also realized that it can all be done online uh, at the, at the um, platforms themselves or of the plots themselves. So therefore we also have a list that you just saw that can be downloaded. Now let me go through because now it does the same thing again. Let's go to the partner one, uh, the buyer one. So here you have the analog screen. I didn't show you with the local partner, but it goes the same way. So uh, our friend Tom Corp is logging in and he uh, opens the buyer dashboard. It welcomes me as a buyer and it then shows on the right side how many CRUs I've actually purchased as a buyer from how many farmers they're coming from and in which countries they have been generated. Well, if you scroll down further, you can see when I purchased it. And here you can also already see that I'm planning to purchase another 50 CRUs in 2022. A more detailed overview of which countries the, the CRUs are from, and also once again, the vintage year of the CRUs. But you can go into more detail in this year over the CRUs, and you can have two different screens. You can either see it on a map and collect per country or per vintage year or the intermediary that you bought from, um, or you can see it as a list. We'll go there in a second. Let's first zoom in on a plot. Here you can actually see the farmer details of the plot. So John 23 has generated 60 crews that you have bought from John 23. It also shows that his main income is coming from coffee and that he uh, was already working on agroforestry when he got onboarded on the Acorn program. Well, for so far, uh, a uh, short uh, preview of, of what you can see already in, in the Acorn um, platform. Oh, no, it goes on. Sorry. <laughs> we also have, of course, next to the map function, we have the list function, uh, which again allows you to, to categorize per country, vintage year, intermediary, and so forth. There we go. So, for so far, the methodology I, of uh, the framework, I would now like to go into the methodology, the carbon quantification for small scale agroforestry projects. This document starts by uh, defining what the applicability conditions are. And also, once you've seen the applicability, you know that this methodology can be applied to any project. It then justifies which carbon pools are being considered and which uh, emission sources are being considered. It highlights the requirements for model development and model validation, and it also explains how the models are applied and how the carbon quantification 
is actually calculated by demonstrating the um, equations. There are three adjustment factors, which I will dive into in a bit. And it also explains what, how to apply the appropriate, appropriate root shoot ratio. At the back of this methodology, we also provide a guide for ground truth data collection and how that's being done within ACORN. It's good to know that the methodology does not include information on the specific carbon models themselves, as we respect the in, uh, intellectual property of our partners. Um, then, what accuracy criteria are applied to the carbon models and how are the carbon, carbon models being developed? Well, within ACORN, we did develop the carbon models based on the different ecoregions that are out there. So for each ecoregion, uh, we have to collect a minimum of 100 sample plots. And once we have collected those, we will split the data set into three elements, the training part, the test part, and the validation part. So the test part, it already says it, it's being used to train the model. Whereas the test um, part is used to test the accuracy of the model related to the data set. The validation part of the data set is kept aside and for us to also view whether the models are um, accurate on an independent data set. Well, how do we uh, review the uh, model performance? We do that based on three different elements. So the R square, the RSME, and the MAPI, the mean absolute percentage error. What the expected accuracy of our models is 70% and can have an uncertainty of 30%. Good to know is that once there are multiple uh, partners building a similar model, we will always go for the model with the lowest uncertainty. Then let's dive into the first adjustment factor. Uh, in a methodology referred to as the baseline removal, but we often refer to it as, as the pre-project tree adjustment factor. I want to ha also have some videos for you to see. So here on the left, you see actually a LIDAR um, a plot um, with say a number of, of trees. Whereas on the right, you actually see a plot with various trees. So why do I show you this? Because when we determine if we need to apply an, a pre-project tree adjustment factor, we develop a theoretical exp uh, expectation of how many um, tree biomass there will be at the end of the project. And if the amount of pre-project trees contributes for more than 5% of the total amount of biomass expected, we are required to implement an um, adjustment factor for that. If it's less than 5%, we can assume the baseline to be zero. Um, if you, uh, so, so this, once we have to determine the adjustment factor, we will do a number of calculations on a number of sample plots, which we can find uh, equation one, two, three in the methodology. But while working with um, satellite imagery, it's also good to keep in mind the uncertainty of the measurements. Uh, and these are being considered through equations seven and eight as presented here. So all individual above ground biomass uh, measurements uh, will be, an uncertainty will be calculated uh, as seen in equation eight. This then again provides us input for equation seven, where we find the um, uncertainty of the temporal change of the above ground biomass. So the outcome of equation seven um, gives us an indication of what uncertainty adjustment factor should be applied. This can be seen in the table on the right. Meaning that if the uh, uncertainty outcome is below 50%, we do not have to adjust for it. If it's more than 50%, we will have to apply an adjustment factor. That even goes on to 100%. Then the last adjustment factor, uh, which is the adjustment factor with regards to leakage. Um, leakage considers three parameters. Uh, first of all, when we start working with a project and uh, we develop a business case. And in this business case, we also uh, check whether we expect any loss in productivity throughout the project. 
Well, if that's the case, then we will look into what's the proportion of the project area where this potential productivity loss uh, could take place. Um, and that's then being provided as input for A here. The last parameter is the type of land. So um, if the plot is surrounded by, say, cropland or digraded land, we expect the likeliness of leakage taking place to be limited. Whereas if the surrounding area of the plot is considered wetland or forested land, uh, the likeliness of leakage taking place increases. Um, I can show you how we do that by the following demo. Um, so you see here a map and let's zoom in on uh, some plots in Colombia. So the red dots that you see here, if you zoom in further, you actually see the plots. So we zoom out a little bit because what we do is we'll add a buffer of 5% to all individual plots and we aggregate these so that you get an yeah, outer line of where the, where the plots are. And this is then being combined with a data set or data layer actually that indicates the different land types. So here, for example, you see in yellow is the um, cropland, uh, but in purple, I think it, I'm not too sure. <laughs> I won't risk me there what it would be. But, and then um, there's also a second data layer that you see now, the black and white data layer. And that actually shows us um, whether there is forested land or not. So the, the land type you saw before only shows tree cover, but doesn't indicate whether it's actually tree um, density of more than 60% or tree density of less than 60%. And that's the cutoff value where we say it's forested land or not. So this is an approach that we use to determine the uh, leakage factor. Um, and that outcome also directly gives us input for what uh, adjustments should be taken in consideration. Then I have one more demo before I round off my story. Uh, another uh, lovely map with a lot of colors. Uh, what you see here is actually the Eagle region check. So this is based on the data later of WWF. And what you can see, we now zoom again on a number of plots in Colombia. And you actually see here that it's being placed in two different ecoregions. Um, and I think so far, uh, everything I wanted to highlight to you today uh, about the framework and the methodology, I hope it was insightful for all of you. Um, and we kindly ask you to provide us with input uh, on both documents through the feedback form. Um, and uh, all in the same feedback form, you also find a short questionnaire we, we would like you to complete if possible. And feel free, uh, as people have already said, to reach out to me if you have any further questions. Now, I would like to give the floor um, back to, uh, to look. That's super, thank you, Alina. And thank you, everyone who's uh, spoken so far today. Um, Super interesting. Apologies, I think we had a couple of technical difficulties during that, um, so apologies for that, but hopefully everything is resolved now. Um, so plenty of time for the Q&A session, which is good. It's a nice change. Usually uh, you plan 15 minutes and get 10, so it's nice to have gone the other direction this time. Um, I'd like to, and yeah, thank you for all the questions coming in already. I'm already seeing a few uh, themes, which is promising. It means we can get quite a few answered. Uh, I'd like to ask a first question, though, of my own. I think there was an area that might not have been covered, but we, uh, I think it would be useful to go into a bit more detail for those who are about to read the methodology. Uh, specifically, it's around the baselining. Um, I think it would be good for Nick. Uh, Nick, would you be able to give a bit more of a description around the requirements uh, in the baseline and assumptions related to livestock and soil organic carbon and then the reasoning around this? Sure, yeah, I think you're talking about the applicability conditions perhaps for the methodology, yeah. um, which I, mean, I guess those of you who are familiar with the structure of these methodologies, well, this will be uh, nothing new, hopefully, but the methodology starts with a description of the areas and activities that it can be applied to. And 
these firstly relate to meeting Plan Vivo's basic requirements and then the requirements of the, um, the ACON framework as well. Um, so focusing on agroforestry activities and in small parcels of land being some of the main ones. Um, next, I think as mentioned already, I mean, the, the methodology is only for quantification of um, carbon benefits from changes in um, above ground and below ground biomass of woody, ve woody um, vegetation. So to enable that focus on those, that, those carbon pools, the, there are applicability conditions in there to exclude activities that would increase emissions from other sources or decrease um, other carbon pools. So things like not increasing numbers of livestock, not increasing fertilizer additions um, or fossil fuel use. Um, and lastly, there's a, a condition around harvesting and um, the methodology can't be applied when there's planned tree harvesting because the, the accounting approach uses a stock change rather than an average stock approach, which would be required if there was planned tree harvesting in there. So yeah, mostly around meeting eligibility criteria and being able to conservatively exclude um, some of the carbon pools and emission sources. Thank you, Nick. That's great. Uh, so I'll start diving into the questions that have been sent in then. So uh, I've seen a few questions on this requirement around minimum, uh, minimum hectare size, uh, sorry, maximum hectare size for smallholders. Uh, specifically, plot sizes have to be between 0 0.1 hectares and 10 hectares. And we've got a few people asking, well, why, what's the justification around this? Could it change in the future? And why can't we would there be a uh, smallholder land that's greater than 10 hectares? Um, Yelma, would you be okay answering that? Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, so on the, the range of the hectares, if I understand you correctly, from uh, there is a minimum because of the capabilities of the remote sensing that we need a certain size to, uh, to make the, the calculations. So that's uh, with regards to the minimum. The maximum we have said that we said, okay, we want to have a homogeneous pool of uh, carbon removal units from smallholder farmers, uh, while making sure that we maximize uh, the, the potential for farmers uh, benefiting. And what we see is that with this boundary on uh, 10 hectares, and of course, the definitions of a smallholder farmer differ across uh, various uh, bodies, across countries, and also uh, across uh, commodities. With 10 hectares, we are still able to serve the majority of the uh, farmers in uh, the developing countries. So in Latin America, in Africa, and also Southeast Asia and India. Great, thank you, Yama. Um, moving on, I've got a couple of questions for Mila um, around, uh, Mila, you being the remote sensing expert here, around the remote sensing side of things. Um, the first one is um, someone's asked about the minimum number of sample plots that can be used to create a model uh, and like where this data can come from. Like, is it just remote sensing models or are there actual measurements on the ground to train these models up? Or would you be able to provide a bit of information there? Yes, of course, perhaps I should, uh, I should clarify a little bit. So the minimum number we set to 30, of course, this is not uh, the optimal number, but statistically this is backed up uh, by literature. Uh, what our common practice is, of course, 100 uh, as a minimum that we require. And in order to train the models, we need uh, actually three types of data. So there is ground truth data, which is collected in the field as described in the methodology. Uh, so we go to the plots, we measure uh, the number of trees, the size of the trees, uh, we record the type of trees as well, and we also um, conduct a questionnaire with our intermediaries. Um, and then what they report on is um, also planting date and, and um, um, management practice. We use this data, we combine it with LIDAR airborne, or airborne data, and then also satellite image as well. And all of these uh, data sources are input for, for our models. Um, yeah, input for our models. That is it. 
Great, thank you. And while, whilst I've got you on, I have one more. <laughs> um, would, I've had a few questions. Again, I'm trying to choose the ones that have been asked multiple times. And one that I've seen a few times is, can we use this methodology for anything but not related to ACORN? Does it have to go through ACORN for someone to apply this methodology? Um, well, the methodology has been written to be publicly open and accessible to everybody. When we were writing that methodology, this was also something that we had to keep in mind. This is also why it is posted publicly to everybody. So if anybody wants to calculate carbon removal units uh, for smallholder farmers using satellite data, then they can, uh, they're free to follow, to follow it. Um, I, there is no reason not to. Great, thank you, good news. Um, okay, we've got quite a few questions as well. I think, uh, Alina, you, so this will be for you. Uh, you touched a few times on uh, the term durability and we've got quite a few questions about people. I think the market's generally used to the word permanent. So would you be able to provide some information around uh, the difference between durability and permanence, the justifications for its use? And I guess linked to that, we've had a few questions around, well, what if losses occur after planting? How is this reconciled? Um, so yeah, if you could provide some more information on that, that would be great. Yeah, absolutely, uh, Luke. Thank you. Um, yeah, of course, uh, we we do recognize that that the the concept of permanence was was something eh, that that the market was looking for quite a bit. You saw permanence uh, for for hundred years or, or sometimes a little bit less, but well. Due to the nature, uh, I think, of the, the type of project interventions that we have, planting trees, uh, having uh, more sustainable agricultural practices, I don't think you can expect uh, the carbon to be stored for uh, so such a long time. Because we also want to consider the agricultural practice, so it, the, the practice there still needs to remain productive as well. So that's why in also in collaboration with our, or in consultation, I must say, with, with our buyers uh, proposed the concept of durability, which we think is much more suitable for the ACORN uh, project interventions and um, said that we think it's more reasonable to believe that a, a durability of 10, 20 years uh, suits, suits the, the projects within ACORN and is still uh, um, reasonably uh, a good period to, to be to have the carbon stored. Um, I hope that answers a bit of the questions there, but uh, otherwise others feel free to add. In the meantime, I'm also answering some of the questions uh, via the chat. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that. Um... Yeah, so I've got one that I will open to ACORN in general. I'm not sure who will be best, so if anyone wants to take it, that would be good. Um, we're getting several different questions around funding, the sale of CRUs, um, operational costs, etc. So maybe I'll ask a few and maybe you can kind of lump it into one response and then I'll see if there's any gaps in the response. Um, we've got some people asking, like, how are project coordinators funded? Uh, who sells these CRUs um, and are the projects guaranteed sales of CRUs from the start? And can projects coordinators operate on 10% income from the sale of CRUs? So uh, I don't know who would be best for that question. I can take that question, uh, Luke, that's okay. So uh, currently we sell those carbon removal units uh, and what we have said in the market, there is a flow of 20 euros. And those 20 euros should enable the farmer to uh, make sure that he's able to invest in this uh, transition to agroforestry. Out of the 20 euros, we as Acorn uh, keep a 10% fee. The local partner keeps a 10% fee and the farmer gets, like Aileen already explained, 80%, which can be either cash or in kind. There was also one question about uh, the, the finance. So the financing is not in the concept of the, the carbon re removal unit. But when we uh, start a project, we look to several dimensions. So this is also the suitability of the agroforestry scheme. And therefore, often external uh, economists uh, also evaluate this uh, economic uh, design, as well as on the financing side, uh, external financing bodies are also involved to make sure that also those farmers are financed. Um, the 10% for the uh, local partners does not always fully cover the cost. Uh, we are looking how we can make sure that there is a long-term 
support of those lo uh, um, uh, local partners. And what you see is there are some startup costs in the beginning, especially also on the data collection side, for instance, but also the in investments in training and so on are highest in the beginning, whereas they uh, you know, become less over time. Uh, overall, we believe with the 10% for the local partners, there is a, a solid revenue model for them as well uh, to support those farmers. Yelmer, maybe I can quickly add on that because I'm not sure if you touched upon it, but um, so good to know is that we as Acorn do not necessarily guarantee the sales of the carbon credits. I think that was one question that was raised as well. Of course, we do do help support it, but it's not a guarantee that we give up front. Thanks, Alina and Yelma. Um, Another question then, I, I, I mean, oh, I'm happy to answer this one if you allow me. Uh, I'll give everyone else a, a breather um, from the risk of being asked the question. Someone's asked, uh, how do you approach the fact that many smallholder producers uh, don't have land titles? I mean, this is something that we at Plan Bebo have had to deal with for quite some time. And it, I mean, it'd be naive to assume that everyone has formal recognition of land titling. So we take steps um in order to try and re reduce the risk of um grievances around this and trying to ensure that okay if it's, you have customary titling or similar uh that the land of smallholder says is theirs is genuine genuinely theirs and agreed upon within a local community within the framework itself there's uh, a few steps that are taken in terms of what we would ideally like but then okay if, if formal land titling isn't allowed isn't present then okay what are the next steps uh, as the most appropriate, where the final step would be, well, we have a, there's a community participatory approach that, that where community members can feed in if they disagree about uh, who owns what land. So yeah, a common problem, but we have to, uh, we believe we have to be pragmatic about these things. Um, a question for, I'm going to say Alina again, apologies, Alina. <laughs> um, someone asked uh, from a community perspective, um, they think that reforestation or restoration on community land would be an attractive thing. I mean, that allows us to work on larger scales of land uh, on almost a landscape level sometimes. Um, is this out of scope for ACORN or can um, people work on community land? Yeah, so that's something uh, that we uh, look into now as well uh, for how can we make the, the framework suitable also more for community land. Um, I think what's good to know is that we have set a very particular focus now for, for the ACORN framework, so also only on uh, implementing agroforestry. There are, of course, much more uh, elements that we can add later on to the ACORN concept. So maybe also how can we uh, include uh, soil sequestration? It's something that we at this stage uh, do not include in the uh, approach, ACORN approach, but it might be something that we want to consider on, on a later stage. Uh, so maybe also for other type of project activities. Super, thank you. Um, I'm going to pull up a, <laughs> a matter we've already discussed. I think some people are still asking some questions, so I think it's appropriate to kind of bring it back up again. Um, people are still asking about initial, I think there's some interested project developers in this group um, and they're wondering, okay, look, if I wanted to submit a project, who is responsible for that initial financing? of the project. Um, would ACORN be able to provide any support on that or would it be a case of they would need to provide that financing to get started and then once they're in the ACORN program then ACORN continues that support and flow of finance going forwards. Um, I'm not sure who's best for that. So I take it or do you want to answer it? To, you know, never mind. I'll, I'll go for it. Um, so uh, also uh, arranging <laughs> Also arranging the, the, the finance upfront is something that we have not set as a particular element of the ACORN proposition. Nonetheless, I think we're our bank, we are in the position to help um, projects find the, the proper uh, financing uh, in order for them to, to get the projects developed. So uh, we have within the ACORN team, we have uh, various people that are focused particularly on, on the financing. 
and really see if we can uh, get into funds in order to to help stimulate our local partners um, how we can best organize this for also our corporate clients can there be any potential for them um, so it's definitely something that we want to facilitate um, but it's not uh, upfront financing is not something that we can guarantee already yeah is there anything you want to add to that no, I, um, uh, I think like you mentioned, so uh, in, in comparison to Exanti uh, carbon credits, those exposed credits do not in itself carry any financing, uh, but as a bank, we are always, uh, yeah, we have dedicated people in the team uh, that support on arranging the financing of local projects. Super, thank you. Um, I'll say one last question then. I'm conscious of running over. Everyone's super busy these days. Um, uh, hopefully a relatively easy one. Someone's asked a bit more, has asked for a bit more information about the monitoring period, the verification periods, how often these are. So how often does monitoring take place? How often um, does a verification need to take place or can take place? Um, I'm conscious of giving it back to you, Alina, but <laughs> would you like to? No worries, no worries. <laughs> no, not a problem at all. Um, so what we have said is that what you often see in the current market is that projects are being verified on a five year cycle. Um, but since that we are um, aware that we implement a sampling uh, strategy, we have said that um, verification takes place on a three year cycle. But keep in mind that it's on a sample basis. Um, also, um, there is a difference in, in what we monitor for more the socio-economical elements, because um, of course there are, there are elements of a project that we wanna have yearly updates on. So for example, if there are any grievance being reported, we would like to know we don't wanna have projects only reporting this uh, every three years. Um, but considering, uh, for example, more socioeconomical parts uh, there, it would not make sense to ask the projects to update that on an annual basis because the, the impact might not be as significant. Hence, we asked them to only do that once every three years. Uh, there is actually an overview in the framework uh, at the end, uh, in the appendix that gives you an indication of which elements uh, are reviewed by whom and how often. So I can also refer you to that um, if you have more questions on the reporting and the frequency of it. Thank you very much. And I think sadly that means we're out of time for the webinar today. Um, but just quickly highlight again that the deadline for feedback is the 15th of March 2022 and we will be sending out a feedback form uh, through which you can uh, provide your thoughts on the framework and methodology. The methodology and framework uh, will be on the website uh, later today or early tomorrow. The framework's actually technically still there, but the methodology will soon join it. Um, and we will also upload this um, webinar onto the, a, a page on the Plan Bevo website as soon as possible. Apologies if I didn't get to your question today. I tried to go for ones that have been asked several times, but we will make a note of all those that weren't uh, answered and try and get them on the website, on the document as soon as possible. And I guess the final thing to do is to say thank you for everyone who joined today, uh, both the panelists uh, and everyone here as a participant uh, or attendee. So I hope you have a great rest of your day and uh, goodbye. <laughs>